Okay, so this is going to be 50 high yield pulmonology questions. If this is your first time watching one of these videos. What I do is I take a look at the NCCPA blueprint for that specific section, in this case pulmonology. I go through all the topics. I pick a few questions from each topic. So you get a really good, uh, well-rounded review for this specific section. Um, and I stick to the high yield stuff that I feel like you need to know. Um, if I could ask a favor, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do. It really does help get the word out about it. Um, and thank you, as always, for all of the really nice comments you guys have been leaving. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with 50 high yield pulmonology questions. Question one, a 45 year old African-American female presents to the office today for a persistent non-productive cough she has had for the last five months. On exam, you note violaceous plaques on her nose and cheeks. Bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is visualized on chest x-ray. The first line medication for the likely diagnosis in this patient is, that's gonna be oral corticosteroids. So this patient has a pretty classic presentation for sarcoidosis. First, we look at her demographics. African-American female, that's gonna be the most common demographic to see this, uh, to see sarcoidosis in. So we have that. Next, that violaceous, those violaceous plaques on her nose and cheeks, that's something known as lupus pernio, and it's pathognomonic for sarcoidosis. Anytime you see that, right away be thinking sarcoidosis. And then finally, we see that she has bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy on chest x-ray, another common finding in sarcoidosis. So all of that points to sarcoidosis, and we know the first line treatment for sarcoidosis is going to be your oral corticosteroids. So this is a way that I've come up with to remember the things you need to know. Remember that in um, sarcoidosis, your ACE levels are very high. That's one of the findings that you need to know. Um, so ACE level super high, it stands for African American, remember three to four times more common. Um, Cough, dry cough, your pulmonary complaints are going to be the, the most common clinical manifestations. E stands for erythema nodosum, another dermatologic finding in sarcoidosis. Lupus pernio, as we described in the vignette, pathognomonic for sarcoidosis. S, steroids, which is your first line treatment. And then H stands for hilar lymphadenopathy, your bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy that you'll see in sarcoidosis. Question two, which tuberculosis medication can cause reddish orange secretion, like in your ear, uh, your, your tears, your urine? Um, that is going to be rifampin. The way that I used to remember that, these are the meds for your for tuberculosis treatment. I used to remember rifampin is the only one that starts with an R, and that is the one that causes red or reddish orange secretions. So that's how I remembered that. Um, isoniazid causes peripheral neuropathy. So I used to remember isonum instead of isoniazid. Uh, P stands for pyrazinamide. I have a detailed description in the tuberculosis. I'm not going to go over that here. Um, and then a thambutol, only one that starts with an E, and you have all these eye complaints like optic neuritis. So those are some of your high yield ADRs for your tuberculosis medications. Question three, what antibiotics are commonly used in the treatment of community acquired pneumonia in an outpatient setting? So those medications are going to be macrolides like azithromycin, amoxicillin, and doxycycline. And then plus or minus your fluoroquinolones. Remember, those are only going to be used in patients with comorbidities or risk factors for drug-resistant pathogens. So those are the main ones that you need to know. Question four, homeless patient presents to the ER with a productive cough, foul-smelling sputum, and admits to blacking out two nights ago due to excessive alcohol use. On physical exam, you know it decreased breath sounds and dullness to percussion in the right lower lung field. Which antibiotics should be considered in this patient for the likely diagnosis? So what you should be thinking of here is the fact that this patient has a pretty classic presentation for aspiration pneumonia, and those patients you're going to give either amoxicillin clavulanate, which is augmented, or ampicillin sulbactam, depending on the severity, because these are both given PO or IV, so it um, depends on the severity. Now, what are the keys to the vignette? Well, first, foul-smelling sputum. Literally, that's all I could have said, and right away you should be thinking aspiration pneumonia. That's a big one for that. Um, so, and then the other thing is, anytime you see a patient that has reduced consciousness, whether it's a patient who had a seizure or stroke, um, in this case, that happened to be due to alcohol use, we have to consider aspiration. In this case, this patient likely vomited and aspirated. Um, and then on physical exam, we see he had decreased breath sounds and dullness of percussion in the right lower lung field, the most common area for aspiration pneumonia to be present um, due to the angle of the right main stem bronchus and the aspirated contents winding up in this area, leading the, to the consolidation. So again, this is aspiration pneumonia. You're going to use amoxiclav, augmented, or ampicillin sulbactam as your first line treatments. Question five, what medications are used in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis to slow progression of the disease. So these are going to be two meds. They're part of the antifibrotic class, and they're known as perfenidone and etadenib. So there's no medications that, that can cure idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but these are the only two meds that have shown any um, disease to slow the disease progression. They're really the only two that you need to know um, outside of maybe steroids for acute exacerbations, but otherwise these are the ones that you really need to be familiar with for this disease.
Um, question six, tuberculosis of the vertebrae is known as, and that is Pott's disease. So the way that I used to remember that, um, Pott's disease is tuberculosis of the spine, is that to me, Pott's stacked on top of each other look like vertebrae. So that's how I always remembered it. Pots stacked on top of each other kind of look like a vertebral column. So pots stacked on top of each other, vertebral column equals Pots disease, which is TB of the spine. Um, normally affects the, the lower thoracic and upper lumbar region in this, this manifestation. Um, question seven, which type of lung cancer is considered the most aggressive and has the lowest five-year survival rate? So that is going to be small cell lung cancer. So it's very aggressive, uh, the most aggressive form of lung cancer. And about two thirds of patients have evidence of distant metastases at presentation. Um, and only has about a 7% five year survival rate. Um, so that is a very aggressive type of lung cancer. Question eight, a 32 year old female in her third trimester of pregnancy presents to the office complaining of shortness of breath and chest pain that worsens with deep inspiration. On exam, her respirations are rapid and shallow and her vitals reveal a pulse of 122. She admits for the last four days, she has mostly been on bed rest due to difficulty ambulating in her late stage of pregnancy and due to some pain she has had in her left lower extremity. What is the most appropriate diagnostic test to use in this patient to confirm the likely diagnosis? So in this patient, you need to use a VQ scan to diagnose. So first of all, what's the likely diagnosis? It's a pulmonary embolism. She's been immobile for the last four days. She has unilateral lower leg pain, likely from a DVT that she had. Um, and then she's experiencing pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea. She's tachypneic, tachycardic. So right, you know, right away, we should be thinking pulmonary embolism. So you may have thought, well, CT is normally the test of choice for diagnosis, but don't forget she's pregnant. Even though she's in the third trimester, uh, we still have to consider the risk of radiation. So in pregnant patients or patients who have other contraindications to a CT, VQ scan is going to be your diagnostic test of choice to, due to the lower dose of radiation in a VQ scan compared to a CT. So remember, if they give you a pregnant patient, they give you maybe somebody that has an allergy to iodine and contrast, you should be thinking of VQ scan rather than a CT. So don't right away go to the, the CT if there is some contraindications like in this patient. Question nine, a patient who is currently living with his brother who has active tuberculosis would have a positive PPD at what size of induration? So that is going to be five millimeters or greater. So this is considered a high risk patient since they're living in close contact with someone that has active TB. Um, other high risk patients that would be in the same category would be um, patients with um, HIV, immunosuppressed individuals like patients on chemo or chronic steroid use, organ transplantation. So these are the ones that don't get away with anything uh, five millimeters or greater. They, they get away with the least because they're at the highest risk. Um, so five millimeters or greater in this patient will be considered positive PPD. Question 10, patient with a history of tuberculosis has a chest x-ray performed that displays diffuse small nodular lesions spread throughout the lungs. Which type of tuberculosis does this patient likely have? So this patient likely has something known as miliary tuberculosis. Um, the classic appearance in miliary disease is these small infiltrates distributed fairly uniformly throughout the lung. Um, it was originally called miliary TB because the appearance of the nodules and chest x-ray looks like they're millet, they're called millet seeds, these little tiny seeds. Um, that's what it looked like spread throughout the lungs. Um, the name now also kind of implies more of a form of progressive widely disseminated TB, um, but the classic imaging findings, if you ever see um, a description of these diffuse small nodular lesions and you have suspicion for tuberculosis, miliary tuberculosis would be the type. Um, question 11, what is the most common bacterial cause of community acquired pneumonia? You definitely got to know this one. So that's going to be strep pneumo. So streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, as of this time, it's still the most commonly detected bacterial cause of community acquired pneumonia. Its incidence is actually decreasing, which is mainly due to the, the pneumococcal vaccination, which targets this bacteria, um, but it is still the most common cause of your community acquired pneumonia. Uh, question 12, define chronic bronchitis. So I'm looking for the clinical manifestations, the time frame. So remember, chronic bronchitis is going to be a productive cough for at least three months a year for two consecutive years. Um, this is of course in a patient without other causes of chronic cough, like excluded like bronchiectasis, but chronic bronchitis, productive cough for at least three months a year for two consecutive years. Question 13, six year old boy presents to the ER complaining of sore throat that has gotten worse over the last few days. In addition, he's had trouble swallowing and a fever. 
On exam, he is drooling and leaning forward while sitting on his father's lap and refuses to lay down on the exam table. When speaking to you, his voice sounds muffled and he is in visible distress. What is the first and most important uh, step in management of this patient? So the most important thing, no matter what, is going to be management of the airway. This is always going to be the right um, answer for first line management of someone with acute epiglottitis, which this patient clearly has. He has the triad of the three Ds, which is drooling, dysphagia, and distress. Um, combined with the tripoding position he's in on his father's lap to help him breathe better, the muffled voice, sometimes described as a hot potato voice. Um, the first step in these patients is to maintain their airway because at any time their airway can collapse and this can become fatal. So it means avoidance of anything that's going to agitate them. You don't want to use a tongue depressor to visualize the pharynx. Um, they may need bag valve ventilation. Um, calling anesthesia to assist with securing the airway um, when intubation is going to be performed. It's best done in the OR, of course, but anytime you see a patient that potentially has um, acute epiglottitis, you want to make sure you maintain the airway. That is of utmost importance and will be the correct question on the vignette. Question 14, 17-year-old male presents to the office today with pharyngitis, non-productive cough, and earache. On chest x-ray, a patchy infiltrate is visualized. He has no past medical history and is not taking any medication. What is the likely organism causing this patient's symptoms? So that is going to be mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, this patient, uh, we see an infiltrate on x-ray. Um, and why should we suspect mycoplasma? So mycoplasma pneumonia is the most common cause of the quote-unquote walking pneumonia, which we have a classic description of in this vignette. So we have a young, otherwise healthy patient. So um, that's the first check for mycoplasma pneumonia, which is this is common in young, healthy, healthy patients. Next, we have those extra pulmonary symptoms, which are common in mycoplasma. So he has pharyngitis, earache. And then finally, the description of the infiltrate. So with atypical organisms like mycoplasma, it's more common to have these patchy or hazy infiltrates compared to your typical organisms like strep pneumo that have a clearly defined low bar infiltrate in most cases. So remember, this is a young, healthy male. He has those extra pulmonary symptoms, the earache, the pharyngitis, and then on chest x-ray, it's that patchy infiltrate. Right away, we should be thinking atypical organisms. And the most common atypical organism causing the walking pneumonia is going to be mycoplasma pneumonia. So that's the one you should um, consider in this patient. Question 15, patient with sarcoidosis presents with erythema nodosum, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, and polyarthralgias with fever. This syndrome is known as, so that is going to be Lofgren syndrome. Um, so Lofgren syndrome is a very specific finding in patients with sarcoidosis, um, so much though so that accompanied in the right clinical manifestations, you don't even need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. So Lofgren syndrome is very specific to sarcoidosis, and that is the, the symptoms that you'll see in these patients with Lofgren syndrome. Question 16, what treatment option is most effective in patients with small cell carcinoma, small cell lung carcinoma? most uh, effective treatment option is going to be chemotherapy. So small cell lung cancer is very responsive to chemo, plus or minus radiation, but chemo is uh, the best treatment for these patients. Surgery is rarely, if ever, going to be used. It's just not effective. Um, but remember, chemo is the best treatment option for these patients, the number one treatment option for small cell lung cancer. Um, the unfortunate part is while small cell lung cancer is very responsive to chemo, the cancer in most cases is going to relapse within two years um, despite treatment. So the way that I used to remember the things that you needed to know about small cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, SCLC, stands for smoking. Cigarette smoking has a strong association with this type of lung cancer. This one in squamous cells is the most commonly associated with smoking. C stands for central. The mass is often located in the central part of the airway. L stands for Lambert-Eaton syndrome because perineoplastic syndromes like Lambert-Eaton syndrome are common, uh, most common in small cell. And then chemo, because remember, that's uh, it's extremely responsive to chemo, more so than any other therapy. Question 17, a combination of asthma, nasal polyps combined with chronic rhinosinusitis, and sensitivity to aspirin is known as, that's going to be Samter's triad. And not a lot of not to know, not a lot to know there. Just that triad is Samter's triad seen in patients with asthma and these other findings. Uh, question 18: A soft tissue lateral cervical radiograph would display what classic finding in a patient with acute epiglottitis? So what you would be looking for here is something known as the thumbprint sign or the thumb sign. So it's caused from an enlarged epiglot uh, epi epiglottis protruding from the anterior wall of the hypopharynx and on imaging it looks like the tip of a thumb poking out so you can see it right here that's just due to the the radio opaque um 
epiglottis, which is inflamed here. Uh, most of the time, it's not something you're going to really use as far as your diagnostic test because it's not always going to be there and it's really not something that you need imaging for diagnosis. Um, but it is makes for a very easy exam question, so you really should be aware of that. So remember, that's the thumb or the thumbprint sign on acute epiglottitis. Question 19, which type or what type of lung cancer is most commonly seen in non-smokers? So that is going to be adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is the most common type of lung cancer seen, am seen among non-smokers. Um, per the CDC, about 50 to 60% of lung cancers um, found in people who never smoked are adenocarcinomas. Question 20, a patient presents with a cavitary lesion and a proximal bronchus visualized on imaging. Labs show an elevation in serum calcium levels. Which type of lung malignancy does this patient likely have? So this patient likely has squamous cell carcinoma. So how do we know that this is squamous cell and not another type of malignancy? You have to remember the four C's of squamous cell carcinoma. So the four C's, remember squamous cell is spelled with a Q, but you instead change it to a C to remember that squamous cell lung cancer is all about the C. So first, centrally located. We see that they had a lesion in the proximal bronchus, so it's central location of the airway, which is common in squamous cell lung cancer. Uh, the other C, not mentioned, but it is important to know that cigarette smoking, like I mentioned before, small cell and squamous have the strongest association with uh, cigarette smoking. C, calcium elevation, hypercalcemia, which we saw in this patient. And then the final C is going to be cavitary lesions. Remember, we saw a cavitary lesion in the proximal bronchus in that central airway. And that's why we know the likely type of lung cancer would be squamous cell lung cancer. Uh, question 21, a six-month-old boy presents with, ha with a harsh barking cough. On exam, you note inspiratory strider at rest, marked intercostal retractions, and cyanosis. He is diagnosed with laryngotracheitis, um, which is also known as croup, and is started on nebulized epinephrine to relieve his symptoms. What other therapy should be considered in this patient for relief of his respiratory symptoms? So that is definitely going to be dexamethasone. So moderate to severe croup as this patient has, evident by the inspiratory strider at rest, the marked retraction, cyanosis, um, needs to be treated with a combination of both nebulized epinephrine, which we saw here, and then dexamethasone. Um, in addition to your supportive care, like your humidified um, oxygen, air, antipyretics, um, glucocorticoids like dexamethasone, they're really your best treatment option in croup. Um, if you see that as one of your treatment options for croup, just pick that because that's really the one that you can use in all levels of severity with croup. It's, dexamethasone is really your best medication. Um, it's certainly the treatment of choice in this patient in addition to the nebulized um, epinephrine. Question 22, a patient with co-workers pneumoconiosis would likely have nodules in what part of the lungs? So which region of the lungs? And that is going to be the upper lobes of the lungs. So the way that I remember this, um, and you won't forget it, is that what you need to know is wherever the person with the, the pneumoconiosis um, has, uh, wherever they work, whatever height they work at, the lung nodules are going to be the, the opposite location. So if the work they do is down low, the nodule is going to be up high, like in the upper part of the lungs, the upper lobes. If the work they do is up high, the nodule would be down low in the lower lobe. So for instance, in this patient, we had co-workers pneumoconiosis. They worked down low in coal mines. Um, so the nodule is predominantly located in the upper lobe of the lungs. Remember, it's going to be the opposite of what they do. So another example would be somebody with asbestosis. So asbestosis, they work with roofing tiles, insulation in attics, old buildings up high. Well, if they work up high, their pleural plaques are located normally in the lower lobes. And then finally, silicosis, uh, silicosis, the risk factors for that are working with rocks like granite, slate, deep down in the earth. So deep down, their nodules are located in the upper lobe. So if you remember for your pneumoconiosis, whatever work they do, if it has a predilection for a certain part of the lung, which a few do, um, wherever they do the work, if it's up high, the lung nodules or the pleural plaques are going to be in the lower lobes. If they do work down low, it's going to be the opposite in the upper lobes. So remember the opposite of where they do their work. Uh, question 23, a 42-year-old male presents to the office complaining of fever, cough, and diarrhea for the past week. He has no past medical history and works as a plumber. His labs show elevated hepatic transaminases as well as hyponatremia. What diagnosis should be suspected in this patient? So right away, you should be thinking of Legionella. So as soon as you see diarrhea combined with a cough, right away, you should be start thinking of Legionella as one of your differentials. So that's the first uh, red flag we have in this case. But obviously, there's other things that can cause this. So the vignette, we also see he works as a plumber. So remember the risk factors for Legionella. 
is um, contaminated water sources. So working with plumbing systems, shower heads, sink faucets, all things that this patient would, would have as occupational exposure to um, as a plumber. So that's your second red flag. And then finally, we see those lab findings, hyponatremia, elevator, elevated liver enzymes on labs, both potential findings in Legionella. Um, of course, to confirm the diagnosis, you do PCR testing, but in this presentation, there is more than enough in this vignette uh, to lead to the diagnosis of Legionella as the most common or the likely diagnosis in this patient. Question 24, mucin or gland formation visualized on histology is suspicious for which type of pulmonary neoplasm? So that is going to be adenocarcinoma. So this type of cancer arises from the bronchial mucosal glands. So if they mention histologic findings with mucin production or gland formation, be thinking of adenocarcinoma. Question 25, 16-year-old male with a history of asthma presents to the office due to worsening of his asthma over the last year, over the past year. The only medication he currently uses for asthma is albuterol PRN. He currently has symptoms three to four times per week and is woken up four times per month with wheezing and a dry cough. Which medication is recommended for this patient in addition to his albuterol inhaler? So that is going to be an inhaled corticosteroid, a low dose. So referencing the NAEPP 2020 guidelines, this patient has mild persistent asthma, step two, um, which is evident by the nighttime awakenings four times per month and the daytime symptoms three to four times per week. At this level, we add a low dose inhaled corticosteroid to their SABA to, for the treatment. Um, and whether you're referencing the NAEP 2020 guidelines or the newer GINA guidelines, at step two, doesn't matter. Either way, you're adding a, an inhaled corticosteroid. GINA, also, GINA guidelines also have the option of uh, low dose ICS combined with Remoterol. Um, but I think for your boards, focus on the NAEPP, NAEPP 2020 guidelines um, over the GINA guidelines, which are newer and not used as commonly here in the U.S. So stage two for this patient, add an inhaled corticosteroid low dose to his SABA. Question 26, a 62-year-old woman presents to the office complaining of a chronic productive cough that contains thick sputum and at times she notes that it has even been tinged with blood. CT of her chest is ordered and reveals dilated bronchi and thickening of the airway. The CT also reveals that the bronchioles appear abnormally larger than the adjacent pulmonary artery. No appreciable mass is visualized on CT. What is the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that's going to be bronchiectasis. So how do we know that? First, she has a persistent productive cough with hemoptysis. Those are all classic uh, clinical manifestations in bronchiectasis. It's not enough to make the diagnosis though. Um, her CT findings display thickened dilated bronchioles. Also mentioned, if you see there, is something known as the Signet ring sign, um, which is when the airway diameter, the bronchioles, are larger than the adjacent vessel diameter, the pulmonary artery. So that's a classic finding in bronchiectasis known as the Signet ring sign. So if you look up a Signet ring, it's a ring that has a larger diamond on top. So it's supposed to be the circle of the ring um, is the larger bronchial, and then the circle on top of the little gem or whatever is supposed to be um, the pulmonary artery, whatever. <laughs> Don't worry about that. So remember, Signet ring sign on um, bronchiectasis. Um, so those are the things that we see here, and those are all classic findings in bronchiectasis. And then finally, you have to rule out your differential, particularly uh, pulmonary malignancy due to the hemoptysis cough. But you see in the vignette, they don't mention weight loss. The CT did not show pulmonary mass. I specifically stated that. So it leaves us with the most likely diagnosis, which is going to be bronchiectasis. Question 27, a 14-month-old female presents accompanied by her mother. Mother states the child has had sudden, severe coughing episodes that often end in the child vomiting. She also describes a noise that the child makes after each coughing spell that almost sounds like the child is having trouble catching her breath. The mother states the child is not up to date on her immunizations. If antibiotics were initiated in this child for the likely diagnosis, which antibiotic class is preferred? So that is going to be your macrolides like azithromycin. So the child in this vignette has severe paroxysmal coughing fits, post-tussive emesis, um, and that noise she's making after coughing spells that the mother described, it's the classic inspiratory whooping sound. Um, she's not up to date on her vaccines. This is a very classic presentation for pertussis, aka whooping cough. So if you prescribe antibiotics, often supportive measures are enough, but if you do use antibiotics, you're going to be using macrolides. That's your antibiotic class of choice for pertussis. So azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, any of those can be used in a patient with pertussis whooping cough like this patient has. Question 28. 
what is the most common cause of acute bronchiolitis? So the most common cause of acute bronchiolitis is going to be RSV, which is your respiratory syncytial virus. Um, it's the most common cause of bronchiolitis, and the virus um, most often detected is the sole pathogen found. Um, and then, of course, the second most common cause of acute bronchiolitis is going to be a rhinovirus. But remember, your RSV is your most common cause. Question 29, patients with secondary or reactivation TB will most commonly have localization of cavitary lesions in which region of the lungs? So that is going to be in the apices, the upper lobes. So reactivation tuberculosis typically involves the posterior segment of the apices of the upper lobes in around 80 to 90 percent of patients. Remember, if they mention the upper lobes, you should be thinking this is um, reactivation or secondary tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Uh, question 30, a four-year-old boy presents to the office with his mother. The mother describes a harsh barking cough he has had for the past week that gets worse when he is agitated. She also states he has had a low-grade fever and is hoarse when he speaks. An AP cervical spine x-ray is performed that displays subglottic narrowing of the airway. This sign is known as, and that is going to be the steeple sign. So subglottic narrowing of the airway is known as the steeple sign in patients with croup, also known as laryngotracheitis, um, which this child has evident by the seal-like or barking cough, horse with agitation, he has a low-grade fever, hoarseness, um, all classic findings. And this test is not really often performed. Croup is very much a clinical diagnosis. Um, but, and the steeple sign doesn't necessarily have a very high test, sensitiv test sensitivity, but it doesn't mean it's not gonna come up on a question. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this is the steeple sign. You can see this narrowing of the airway here, just like in a steeple. So that's why they call it the steeple sign, like in a church steeple kind of gets to a narrow tip here. You can see the airway narrows like that. So that's why they call it the steeple sign in croup. Question 31, what is the first line medication used for treatment and prophylaxis for pneumocystis pneumonia, also known as PCP? So that is going to be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim. The way that I used to remember that is pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP. Your posterior is coarse and prickly. You need your back trimmed, so back trim. So PCP pneumonia, your posterior is coarse and prickly. You need your back trimmed, back trim. So PCP first line for treatment and prophylaxis, uh, back trim. All right, question 32. A 24-year-old male presents to the emergency department complaining of right-sided chest pain and shortness of breath that began two days ago. He states the symptoms started when he was at home watching TV and came on suddenly. He initially thought that this may have just been a muscle strain, but it has not improved over the last couple days and he is getting worried. On exam, he is tall and thin and escultatory findings reveal breath sounds that are diminished in the right hemithorax compared to the left. Describe what would likely be heard on percussion of the right side of the thorax in this patient. So in this patient, you are going to hear hyperresonance to percussion. So this patient clearly has a pneumothorax, uh, specifically a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. It's evident by the fact that he fits the criteria. He's young, thin, and tall, and a male. Uh, the second key is that there was no precipitating trauma or event to cause his pneumothorax. Um, you have diminished breath sounds on the right side. He also has the dyspnea, chest pains. So pretty clear presentation. Um, so why do we have hyperresonance per to percussion? Well, anytime there's air trapping, so like in a pneumothorax, you have air trapped in the pleural space, you're gonna have hyperresonant no uh, hyper notes to percussion. So this is true in any disease that causes excess air to be trapped, so COPD, asthma. Just remember, puffing out your cheek and tapping on it, that's hyperresonant. That's because of all the air that's trapped in your cheek. So any air trapping condition, you're gonna have hyperresonant notes. And it's the reason why the opposite, when you have fluid or a consolidation, you're gonna have dullness to percussion. So air is gonna give you hyperresonance, and then fluid or consolidations is gonna give you dullness to percussion. Question 33, a 66-year-old male presents to the office with history of a non-productive cough. He works for a construction company that restores and renovates old buildings. On chest x-ray, an ill-defined cardiac border and bilateral pleural plaques are noted in the lower lobes. What diagnosis should be suspected in this patient? So that's going to be asbestosis. So we have to go back and remember what we talked about earlier. This patient has one of the pneumoconioses. Remember, he works up high renovating old buildings. So his pulmonary findings are gonna be low down in the lower lobes. And as we see, the pleural plaques are noted in the lower lobes. Um, we also see that on chest X-ray, he has an ill-defined cardiac border. That's known as the shaggy heart sign. 
which is another common imaging finding in asbestosis. Finally, we see that they mention he works in the construction business, repairing and renovating old buildings. Those are all risk factors um, for asbestos, plus the history of a non-productive cough. All signs point to asbestosis. Question 34, what is the most common cause of a laryngotracheitis croup? So that is going to be parainfluenza virus type 1. Uh, the way that I used to remember that is instead of paratroopers, this guy parachuting here is a paratrooper, I used to remember paracroopers. So most common cause of croup is parainfluenza virus type 1. I never forgot that, and I think I've told you before, I work in endocrinology, you know how many times I've seen croup? Zero. Um, so the fact that I still remember that means it must be a pretty good visualization, I would say. So remember, anytime you think of croup, remember paracroupers, and remember parainfluenza virus type 1 is the most common cause of croup. Uh, question 35, an 11-month-old boy presents in the, to the office today. Uh, the mother states that the child has had frequent bowel movements per day and the stools are often loose or appear shiny. She also notes over the last year the child has had multiple lung infections and has been on a number of antibiotics, but the infections just seem to keep coming back. On exam, the child is below the 5th percentile in both height and weight. What is the test of choice to make the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be a sweat chloride test. All right, so this child clearly has cystic fibrosis. Frequent bowel movements, the loose or shiny stools, this is from malabsorption. So there's diarrhea and steatorrhea, which is those greasy stools she's describing as shiny. Uh, plus the recurrent upper respiratory infections, those lung infections, um, along with the, the below average growth rate. So these patients, that's a, that's a you know, pretty classic presentation for cystic fibrosis. And in these patients, sweat chloride test remains the primary and, and the best test for diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Question 36, what medication class should never be used as monotherapy in treating long-term asthma? So that is going to be your LABAs, your long-acting beta-2 agonists, like formoterol, salmeterol. These medications you never use by themselves. Um, they increase the frequency of treatment failures. They're associated with an increased risk of asthma-related death. Um, so really the own, only wrong answer in asthma treatment is a LABA by itself. It always must be combined with an inhaled corticosteroid. So remember that not really just so much for your vignettes, but for real life too. That's very important to know. Question 37, patient with pertussis is experiencing the characteristic severe paroxysmal coughing fits combined with inspiratory whooping after the coughing fit. Which of the three phases or stages are they currently in? Catterall, paroxysmal, or the convalescent phase? So this patient is going to be in the paroxysmal phase. So you have three phases with pertussis, the, the catterall phase, um, which is generally where they just have their upper respiratory symptoms, their cries, their mild cough. Um, this is also when transmission is actually highest. And then when it really kicks in and they have the classic presentation we see in this vignette, that's the paroxysmal stage. Uh, the inspiratory whoop, the coughing fits, the post emesis, etc. And then that concludes with the convalescent stage where the cough slowly subsides over weeks to months as they progress and get better. So this patient is in the, in the paroxysmal phase. Uh, question 38, the majority of malig malignant lung nodules are found in what region of the lungs? So that is going to be the upper lobes. So malignant no nodules can be found in any lobe of the lung, but those are that located in the upper lobe have much higher probability of being malignant. About two thirds of all malignant nodules are found in the upper lobes of the lungs. Remember, if you have a pulmonary nodule in the upper lobe, it is at a much higher risk for malignancy rather than a different area of the lungs. So upper lobes, high risk of malignant lung nodules. Question 39, which type of emphysema is most commonly seen in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? So that is gonna be something known as panacenar or panlobular, which is a diffuse um, type of emphysema. Um, so destruction in this type is seen in all parts of the of the acinus and it's most commonly seen in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, there's also something known as central lobular, which is destruction of the central and proximal part of the acinus. And it's more commonly seen in emphysema patients who are smokers. Um, the way that I used to remember that, central lobular starts with a C, so you think of cigarettes, and then panlobular or panacenar, which is seen in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I always had this visual, so panlobular or panacenar emphysema, I think of a pan, and then I think of cooking steak in the pan, and what do you put on steak? You put A1 sauce, so alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, panlobular or panacenar emphysema. That's the way I used to remember that.
Question 40. In a hemodynamically stable patient with a pulmonary embolism, what treatment option would be indicated if anticoagulation is contraindicated? So this is a stable patient. Um, they cannot be put on anticoagulants. It's contraindicated. So what are you going to do for this patient? They're going to give them an IVC filter. So an IVC filter, it's a small filter you place in the inferior vena cava so that if this patient has another DVT that gets dislodged and, you know, pulmonary the embolism heads up to the the pulmonary vasculature it can't get there this this um this little filter will stop it um it'll get stuck in this little filter in the ivc so it never gets to the pulmonary vasculature so who do you use these in well they have to be stable um and then the ivc filter should be considered in patients that have either a contraindication to anticoagulation so maybe they have a hemorrhagic stroke recent surgery um, another reason will be that they have recurrent emboli despite being adequately anticoagulated. So they're already on anticoagulation, but they still get um, consistent emboli. Um, or if they're a high-risk patient, like patients with underlying cardiopulmonary disease, right, uh, ventricular dysfunction, whereas if they had another PE, it could be fatal. So the reasons you use an IVC filter, one, they can't take anticoagulants, two, anticoagulants don't work for them, or three, they're going to die if they get another PE. Those are the reasons you're going to use an IVC filter. Question 41. Horner syndrome, which is classically seen in a superior sulcus or pancos tumor, is a triad of what three clinical manifestations? So that is going to be ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. So ptosis, remember, drooping of the eyelid. Meiosis is going to be constriction of the pupil. And anhydrosis is just a lack of sweat. They're all seen in, um, they all can potentially be seen in superior sulcus tumors, which is a tumor that's commonly seen in non-small cell lung cancer. And this type of tumor is located it's like the apices of the lungs, and it leads to this neurologic syndrome. Um, Horner syndrome can be produced by a mass anywhere along the sympathetic pathway that's a, you know that supplies the head, eyes, and neck. But this is common um, in these superior sulcus or pancos tumors that are seen um, in non-small cell lung cancers. Question 42: A 47-year-old male presents to the office today complaining of shortness of breath and chest pain. Chest X-ray and ECG are ordered. Chest X-ray reveals a shallow wedge-shaped opacity in the periphery of the lung, and EKG displays deep S-wave in lead 1, prominent Q-wave in lead 3, and T-wave inversion in lead 3. What diagnosis should be suspected in this patient? So this is going to be a pulmonary embolism. So chest pain, dyspnea, a lot of differentials for what this patient has, but the key to the vignette is the results of the diagnostic test. So on ECG, you have what's known as S1, Q3, T3. It's not necessarily very specific or a, a sensitive indication on PE uh, for a PE, but if you see it in the right clinical context, like in this vignette, it better be on your list of differentials of pulmonary embolism. So S1, Q3, T3 on ECG, it's a prominent S wave in lead one, Q wave in lead three, um, and an inverted T wave in lead three. And then on chest X-ray, you have what's known as the Hampton's hump. Um, it's this wedge or hump shaped opacity in the periphery of the lung due to the infarction caused by the pulmonary emboli. So this patient definitely should be uh, suspected. You definitely should be suspicious for a pulmonary embolism due to the diagnostic findings. Question 43, a 42 year old female is brought to the ER by fire rescue after a near drowning incident at a local beach. She is admitted and on the second day she becomes um, unstable. And on exam you notice she is tachypneic, tachycardic and diffuse crackles are auscultated bilaterally. Chest X-ray displays diffuse pulmonary infiltrates bilaterally that spare the costophrenic angles. Pleural effusion, cardiomegaly, and pulmonary venous congestion are all absent on imaging. What diagnosis should be suspected in this patient? So in this patient, we should suspect acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Um, so when you see a patient that has had some sort of severe trauma infection, near drowning episode, um, sepsis or shock can also be um, other reasons for any other critically ill patients. Um, and then they mention a chest x-ray that has these diffuse pulmonary infiltrates or air bronchograms. Um, and they purposely mention that there's no findings to indicate which would potentially be congestive heart failure. So they mention there's no cardiomegaly, no pleural effusion, um, spares the costophrenic angles. This is all classic for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then right away, this is what you should be thinking in this vignette, um, the presentation on the imaging, um, and then also the history of the traumatic event, the near drowning episode.
all classic for ARDS. Uh, question 44, patient that shows a decrease in the FEV1, FEC ratio less than 0.70, likely has an obstruction, uh, obstructive or restrictive disease of the airway. Which one do they have with a decrease in the FEV1, FEC ratio less than 70? So that is going to be obstructive lung disease like asthma or COPD. Um, the way that I used to remember that is that a obstructive disease oppress the ratio. They keep it down. The FEV1, FEC is decreased. And then restrictive disease is going to have a normal or increased FEV1, FEC ratio. So I remember the R in restrictive disease stands for raises the ratio or remains the same because it's normal or increased. Obstructive, oppress the ratio. The FEV1, FEC is decreased like we see in this patient. And that's why they have an obstructive lung disease like asthma or COPD. Question 45, compensatory hyperventilation with deep and labored breathing pattern, often in response to severe metabolic acidosis, like in DKA, is known as, and that is going to be Kussmaul respiration. So it's the body's way of attempting to blow off excess CO2 to correct the metabolic acidosis present in a patient, like a patient that's in DKA. Question 46, 39-year-old male presents to the office complaining of pleuritic chest pain. He's recovering from an upper respiratory infection he had three weeks prior. He has no past medical history and is not taking any medication. On exam, you know point chest wall tenderness around the upper sternocostal joints. No edema, erythema, or other abnormalities are noted of the chest wall. ECG, chest x-ray, and labs are all normal. What is the most appropriate treatment option for this patient? So this patient would have supportive measures, and says This is costochondritis. So he's a young male, pleuritic chest pain, a recent upper respiratory infection, uh, no past medical history, normal diagnostic testing, reproducible pain on the exam, which is really important. Um, they all indicate the likely diagnosis of costochondritis, which you just treat supportively. Typically, NSAIDs you'll give to these patients. Question 47, a four-year-old boy presents to the emergency room after his mother noted a sudden onset of cough, dyspnea, and wheeze. Foreign body is visualized via rigid bronchoscopy. What part of the airway is the foreign body most likely located? So that is going to be the right main bronchus. So foreign bodies are most commonly going to be located in the right main bronchus. Um, and children, because it has a more vertical orientation, and it also has a larger diameter compared to the left main bronchus. So if they ever mention a foreign body, remember it's most likely going to be lodged in the right main bronchus. Question 48, a 44 year old male presents to the ER with a productive cough and fever he has had over the last two weeks. Chest x-ray is ordered, which displays an infiltrate in the right lower lobe. On exam, his blood pressure is 98 over 56, pulse is 97, and his respiratory rate is 32. Community acquired pneumonia is diagnosed and it is decided he will be started on antibiotics. Can this patient be treated as an outpatient or should he be admitted? So this patient should be admitted. He should be treated as an outpatient. So how do we know that? Well, we know that because we used CURB-65, which is going to be a point system for confusion, a BUN or, uh, or your urea over 7, respiratory rate 30 or higher, um, systolic blood pressure less than 90, or diastolic blood pressure 60 or less, or an age that's 65 or higher. You get a point for each one of those. And um, a patient that has zero to one points can be treated as outpatient. Patient with a score of two should be admitted to the hospital. And those with three or more should be assessed for um, ICU care. So this patient has two points. Remember his respiratory rate was 32. And his blood pressure doesn't meet it in the systolic part, but it only has to meet one of these. His diastolic blood pressure met the criteria here because it was 56. So he has two points, means he needs to likely be treated as an inpatient. Uh, he doesn't meet the criteria here, here, or here. None of these were mentioned. So we have to assume that he meets two points and he needs to be treated as an inpatient um, and needs to be admitted. So that's your CURB-65. It's fairly easy to memorize. There's not a lot to know there. So I'd probably recommend just knowing, you know, just the basics about that one. A pulmonary nodule is a small, well-defined lesion completely surrounded by pulmonary parenchyma less than or equal to how many millimeters? So that is going to be, um, I'm sorry, that should have been less than or equal to 30 millimeters. I put greater than or equal to 30 millimeters, um, but less than or equal to 30 millimeters. So any larger than 30 millimeters, and it's no longer considered a pulmonary nodule, 
but now a pulmonary mass. So remember, that's supposed to be a less than or equal to sign. Sorry about that. So pulmonary nodule, small well-defined lesion, that is 30 millimeters or less. Question 50, a 58-year-old male presents to the office complaining of persistent diarrhea. He has also noticed episodes of facial flushing, wheezing, and palpitations with no known precipitating factors. Tumor is localized on CT and follow-up bronchoscopy identifies a well-differentiated centrally located tumor in the main stem bronchus. The syndrome of symptoms this patient is experiencing is known as, and that is something known as carcinoid syndrome. So this is a classic presentation um, in a patient with carcinoid tumor. It's a rare neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and this tumor secretes serotonin, histamine, prostaglandins, catecholamines, which all leads to the carcinoid syndrome we see here with the skin flushing, wheezing, diarrhea, um, palpitations. And um, this patient in this vignette had a bronchial carcinoid tumor, which is the second most common area for a carcinoid tumor. Um, the first most common area for a carcinoid tumor is going to be in the GI tract, but this patient has a classic presentation of carcinoid syndrome. All right, so those are your 50 high yield pulmonology questions. I hope it was helpful. Please let me know in the comments if this is helping you. Um, I certainly do appreciate that and I really do appreciate all the comments, the new subscriptions and everything else. Um, so thank you so much for listening and good luck on your pants, your pantry, your EORs and good luck in PA school.